Welcome to this episode of Bad Decisions with Jim Banks. We've had a summer break to get rid of all the emotions from schools and stuff like that. But now that we're getting to darker nights at, at home to bring the uh, podcast back, and I'm delighted to have Sarah, and I'm, I'm going to butcher your, your last name. Is it Steeman or Stamen? Yeah, no, Steeman. Exactly Steeman, there we said. go. Mm -hmm. I always look, when people have names that are Smith or Jones, I'm like, great, I can do this. So Sarah Steeman, who is a business owner who has set up her own business coming up to a year ago, and we're going to talk a little bit about that today. But Sarah, it's great to have you as a guest on the show. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. So t tell us a little bit about your sort of, I always say, let's talk a little bit about your hero story. How did you get into the industry in the first place? You've been doing it quite a while, I believe. And, and yep. maybe just tell, tell us a little bit about how you got into the industry and where, where you progressed to where you are now. Yeah, no, that's a great question. I, I rarely talk about how I got into the industry, but don't forget the industry wasn't really invented when I started in the current form. So actually I was in IT, so I was in technology to begin with, and I wanted to go into marketing. I was working on my master's degree and I had a recruiter that was recruiting for a marketing analytics position. And I took that job. I was working on analytics, so like reporting on nationwide.com. I worked in a big corporation at the heyday of marketing. I was working on actually like taking the customer satisfaction survey that they posted on their website and taking the data and interpreting it for the usability teams and the content team. And again, keep in mind, this is a huge organization. Digital marketing is brand new. It was in flux. And what happened was the analytics team was moving under another manager. And my manager was like, I like you, I want to keep you. So guess what you do now is a CEO in PPC. And there I landed and have not looked back. <laughs> yeah, I always, I always say you can date people as to whether they were pre or post IPO yeah. Google. So yes. it sounds like you were probably a little bit pre, just a little bit pre in terms of the your, your entry into the market. Yeah, so 2007. Yeah, I'm trying to think. No, I think Google IP, had IPO'd at that point. So your post post YouTube, because I think, again, YouTube, I think was 2005 or something Before, like that. Or around YouTube, so YouTube cat videos and YouTube, like, I don't know if you remember the brand channels. So, like, there was a big amount of money you could pay for a brand channel. We did that. But I was YouTube where two young people like myself and an intern could set up Nationwide's YouTube channel in a cafe downtown with no one even caring. <laughs> and it's it's funny, you look at it now and it's like a multi-billion yeah. dollar yeah. industry, yes. like, but it yes. still has those almost like single points of failure. You hear of all yes. these stories of people yeah. forgetting to renew domains because the person who set it up yes. has left the company and they yes, can't their like email that. account. Yes. Right? Yes. And they're, they're, yes. the domain like just yes. lapses because nobody's actually yes. paying any yeah. attention to it. And, yes, um, yes. I came from that generation of marketers. <laughs> okay. I always say when I talk about PPC and Google ads and everything, they, they always say to me, so what's it been like? And I'm like, well, the one thing you can guarantee is that there's <laughs> always going to be change. Yes. Change is yes. the only inevitable that we have. Mm -hmm. It's going to be change. It's going to be rapid, always been rapid. And usually the deck is loaded against us. So Correct. again, I, I run an agency. You're obviously running a training mm -hmm. consulting business now. So we, we'll talk about that. But what 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 would you say ha, has been the, the sort of change? How has that kind of impacted your love of the industry? So I would say there's, um, and, and I don't know if it's a chicken or egg thing, but I would say like the industry has become a lot more transactional than it used to be. So when I, and again, I don't know if it's agencies training clients or clients tra training agencies, but there is a go get this result that is the result that I want. I'm going to point at it and you're just going to do it. And that comes from the client to the agency. And the agency has this wait, time out. We need to look at the entire business model. We need to look at the landing page. We need to look at the conversions. We need to look at these like 50 other factors that go into that. And I, but I also blame the industry too, because there's a performance marketing, get this ROAS. Like it almost feels like when you're trying to market yourself as a paid search professional, you're trying to sell them on Google ads. Yeah. And so it's a chicken and egg thing that it, it's a bit of a shame because I believe that when you work tightly with the client and you look at all these factors, you can actually deliver 
astronomically better performance. Yeah, it's, it's funny you touch on that. I, I always remember back in the very, very early days when I first started, I started my first agency in 2000. And I always remember like the sort of finding new clients. It was like shooting fish in a barrel. There were so many yes. people that wanted help. And, and I think the, the beauty of digital marketing back then is it was such a trackable point of entry to point of exit solution. Yeah. You can pinpoint exactly how much money you spend, how much money you get. And historically, marketing has never worked that way. You've always like, right. I've spent a million dollars. I've made some money, but I don't really know how much of it has come from that marketing campaign versus other stuff that's gone on. Whereas we were able to say, if you spent 50,000 and you made mm -hmm. 500,000, you can say you made 10x your spend. And I always feel like with the way we've gone, and certainly in the last few years, we've almost like gone back to the, we don't really know what's happening. There's right. so much more yeah. that's in the ether with influencer yes. marketing. It's like somebody puts stuff out there. There's no trackable like outcome. So you have to throw in a, no, a lot more fuzzy logic to the kind of the yes. way in which you interpret the results. You can say, yes, they have happened. But I think that's where having a good marketing mix and understanding mm -hmm. all of the component channels that make up that marketing mix, which for me, in, in some respects, that's one of the things that uh, I'm struggling with some of the AI solutions that Meta have got, that Google have got, Microsoft have yeah. got, because they're all working on their own platforms. They're not platform agnostic like most agencies right. or consultants are or in-house. In-house obviously manages all the channels, whereas Google just does Google. Microsoft mm -hmm. just does Microsoft. Meta just does Meta. So yeah. again, I, I'd love to know what your thoughts were as to whether that's something that, because they say, oh, it's great, it's fantastic. Our results are going to be phenomenal, but they're not really understanding the yeah. full requirements of the business to be able to say that with, with some degree of confidence. I think there's probably an element of bullshit in there, really. All of the above. And I think that's the hard part. I almost would argue, and I hate saying this as an independent freelancer, that in some ways, clients can be better served by an agency at this point because it really has to be everywhere. You have to be fluid among Meta, Google, frankly, organic social, which I think is highly underutilized still. And it's not necessarily underutilized. I also think it's underutilized and undervalued. I have a lot of theories there. I think one of the theories is that it is a typical women-dominated industry and industries that are women-owned and or dominated tend to be seen as lesser than. I always remember I was doing some consulting <laughs> for a company back in the day that's, that sold magnetic eyelashes. And during the pandemic, I think they sold like four or five million sure, dollars worth of magnetic sure. eyelashes in one month. And I'm like, yeah. what the that hell is going really, on? I actually want those. <laughs> but, but obviously people were sitting at home and watching yes. <laughs> social media posts that people kind of going, and this is how you attach them. And they're like, wow, that's amazing. So again, lots of user-generated content. Uh, but again, I think when you look at it, so much of the user generated, to me, user generated content is, it should be, you know, user as in the end user, the prop, a proper customer. But so mm -hmm. much of it is like influencers that don't have a clue what the product is. They just get sent it. They get yes. told to film it and they go, here's this person using the product. But you've got these 22 year old, beautiful women putting on <laughs> the skin cream yes. <laughs> to put anything on their skin at all. Yeah, this looks beautiful, right? Pointless. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I think that that goes into like what we used to always talk about in the good old days of marketing, the halo effect. So you see something on TikTok, if you're not buying it through TikTok shops or if you're seeing it on, you know, wherever. You think about it later and then Google, and are they going to have a presence on Google? Did they do SEO in any way, shape, or form? Did they, do they have paid ads that are right there to capture you with the beautiful landing page? Like, too much of that has been lost, especially in small and mid-sized businesses that need it the most. Yeah, so, so one of my guests on last season's kind of podcast episodes was Boris. Yeah, Cherry, I love him. <laughs> right, who I, lo I absolutely love. Boris is a great guy, right? Um, he does consulting for, for yes. clients rather than doesn't call himself an agency, he just works yes. freelance solo. But what what was really interesting is that the kind of the way he he has leveraged social media, so LinkedIn and, and places mm -hmm. like that, to help put him himself out there. And I, I know that you're I would guess I would call you quite prolific in that regard, putting content out across the board. So you've got YouTube, you've got Instagram, you've got TikTok, top, yeah. you've got 
Where else are you? Like- uh, yeah, YouTube, YouTube Shorts. I, I am on Instagram. That makes me a little bit tired. TikTok. I mean, pretty much everywhere. Um, and I go against the green. I believe you have to be omni-channel at this point. And I don't even try moving people to a primary. But my primary is LinkedIn, for yeah. sure. I know that your most recent post on your YouTube channel, which will be in the show notes, I've put all of the links to all your stuff in there so people can go and follow you. Because again, I, I love the fact that you're very opinionated. You talk from <laughs> heart, which I love. But one of the most recent videos that you posted was talking about the size of your channels and, and obviously the money yeah. that you make. And I think there's yeah. there's sometimes people just assume that there's a correlation between the two, but quite often the kind of correlation is not as direct as that's the money I make from that size audience. Because obviously... Yeah some of that audience will be people that are looking for consulting help. Mm-hmm. So clearly the, the the return for you is going to be driven by the value of the the, the, um, the client that you can bring on board. So how do you actually find most of the clients that you work with now? So I would say 99% come through LinkedIn uh, for sure uh, with occasional tire kickers through the other platforms. And then how I look at the other platforms um, is almost a practice type of place. So like certain things that work phenomenally well on LinkedIn, I got from TikTok. So like on TikTok, it's just, and I'll go with each channel here. TikTok is very superficial. So it's like hot girl summer, hot girl locks. Like it's just, it's a fun place. Um, So I took that over to LinkedIn and said, well, here's my hot girl PPC summers that post did really, really well. And just, I will only take consulting clients. So I tie it back into my offer, but I sort of practice. Also other things are the hooks are very, very important on TikTok, YouTube shorts. And so just making sure that you get those locked in helps you become that much better on your primary platform. So sometimes I'm not always using it as like an actual formal get clients method. Um, And then another thing, and I I hate saying this out loud because I wish that people didn't know, or I don't like to share it, but if people don't make on TikTok their profile private, I can actually see who's looking at it. So I can see my like clients or like a lead looking at my TikTok and looking at my profile. (laughs) So I'm like, I know that I'm talking to them because they're visiting my profile and then they'll reach out on LinkedIn or someplace like that email later on. When I talk to people about running my agency, we have way more inquiries that people who want to work with us than we want to work with them. And and that's that's typically a very unusual sort of scenario. Most agencies are scratching around here in the UK. I know lots of agency owners that are really struggling. Some have shut down. It's really impacting their mental health and everything. And for me, again, I don't know what you, what you do, and I'd, I'd be interested to know. But what I've done is I've I've deliberately gone and been very specific about the types of companies that I want to work with, and the companies by default there that I don't want to work with. So again, I always say on my all my profiles say I like to work with businesses that e-commerce businesses that run on Shopify that are doing between one and five million dollars a year in revenue, looking to grow to between five and fifty. Right, because yeah. I know by by default they're going to be mm-hmm. a fairly well established business. So that means I don't work with startups because I, I found quite often startups can be quite arrogant and they don't right. vibe with me. <laughs> I don't work with massive e commerce businesses that do hundred million, two hundred million, five hundred million. We're just a small pea in mm-hmm. a in a in a stew, right? And I'd r- much rather be a more significant contributor right. to the overall success of that business and mm. help have my fingers in lots of different pies rather than, well, you just do the Google and then this guy does the, the Microsoft and this guy does this and this guy's that you, you can have more value that you can, can bring to the table. Um, but that doesn't mean that we don't work with businesses that are not Shopify doing one yes. to five million. Right. But I think a lot of it, then it becomes a, do I like them as a person? Right. Yes rather than do I like them as a business? Because for me, it's it, it's all, again, it sounds blasé, but I'm not doing it for the money. I do it for mm-hmm. the, the value I can bring to the table. And I've always said, I'll put far more money on the table than I will yeah. ever take off the table. And pe- right. the people that start querying how much money I make are not looking at it in the right way. They should be looking <laughs> right. at what they make, not what I make, because right. what I make <laughs> is a byproduct of what they make. Right? Yeah. yeah. I'm not saying sense. it's a percentage, but it's like it's a, there's a definite correlation mm-hmm. between I make money because yes. they make money. 
that makes sense. How do, how do you do that in, t- in terms of the, the kind of the same selection process for your clients that you work with? Well, since I'm new, um, a lot of like throwing flies against the wall. Um, but I will definitely say I take a, an approach um, and it's a bit of a mindset where it's like what I put out there is what I'll attract. And I tend to believe that. So I believe because I'm so, so content driven, I attract a certain type of person that wants to learn, that cares about, especially the content side of their business. Because for me, when I talk to clients, I'm actually training them to get them to not rely on Google Ads as much. I want them to build up that content side so that they can eventually flux down a little bit on the ads front. So I think that's one aspect is because I push so much content, I tend to get that type. But then also on LinkedIn, I have a really, really good discovery form. And so my discovery form, the first question I ask and I make them required is I say, what is your fee for management? Even though I'm not doing management anymore, I haven't changed this form because it still works. And I say 3,500 a month, 5,000 a month, 7,000 a month. And so they force them to make that selection. And so then when they come to me, I'm like, okay, well, I'm already not going to be quoting you less than what you've said you can afford right off the bat. But then I have that conversation with them and realize, can I book at them as a training client or a management client? And like we said, I don't do management anymore, but I always keep management in the back of my mind if it's like this perfect, perfect fit. Uh, so it's so not like you case, don't do it. It's just like you're very selective yeah, about. Very selective. So like where I've been able to make the biggest impact, which is, which is shocking because I don't consider myself a lead gym specialist. I'm actually a e-com specialist, but I make the biggest impact with small budget B2B clients. And that's because a lot of times they value the most from like an organized strategy and structure. And a lot of times they don't have it because when you're spending 3,500 a month, you can't necessarily afford a high quality agency. You've gone either someplace that's holding you hostage and you have to build from scratch, or you've been the victim of unfortunately the snake oil in our industry. And so I tend to do really well with those types of clients and it's a hybrid. So I'll build out the account for them. And then I will put on a loom. I will videotape myself building their account for them. And I'll talk them through every single piece of it. Like, this is why I chose this keyword. This is why I chose these ad groups. And then the goal is for me to like fire myself to get them to manage it. Yeah. Always. Yeah. Cause I, I think a lot of the time, again, if you're good at what you do, I always said like the, the kind of the best PPC experts, broadly speaking, once they're going to get things dialed in, don't have to yeah. kind of do that much. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And, yeah. And, yeah. You know, and, and, you know, you might say, well, at that point in time, they don't need us. Right. They definitely do because like I said it earlier, right? Change is the one thing we're guaranteed to have, right? So again, if you look in the last 12 months, we had performance match, we've had demand gen, there's been all sorts of things that have come in, lots of things that have gone out. And unless you understand what's changed in the landscape, the strategies that may have worked today, might work today, might not work in 12 months time. And the stuff that worked 12 months ago won't work now. Because if you don't know what, what buttons to press or what things to change, you could end up being like in desperate need for yes. help yeah. constantly. So it's so okay. Again, I always think in some respects, it's better for them to just have you on a sort of retainer, right? Where you're, you're there, you, you yes. can offer support, advice, the over the shoulder. And again, I have a lot of the clients that I work with where they are doing a lot of the work and we're just like there to go, what about this? What about this? I'm playing devil's advocate with them. Why did you do that? Why did you do that? And then that way they're able to be more self-sufficient. They don't need to worry about if I got run over by a bus yesterday. I would agree. And I think, you know, that was... Uh... So I have another thing. And again, these are just things that I developed. So like if a client doesn't go with me, I don't follow up. So I don't chase clients. Uh, If they don't respond back after a discovery call, I'm not going to follow up with them. I just, because I never want to start out that relationship where I'm looking to sell them on something. I want them to come to me because they felt that connection. Does that mean potentially I lose business to someone who chases and they're looking at three other people potentially, but it's not something that, I still want to do. And then to your point on that retainer, and I think this is something I battled with. So I have one of my very first clients who I set the entire campaign up for them. 
Uh, it's working beautifully. I'm still in their ads, but they don't have pay me. I'm not part of their retainer, but I still see them in the MCC, which is common. Campaign's going well, but I know that like if that goes off the rails just through like Google changing to your point, or there's been no negative hygiene put on the account, so it could start slowly going in the wrong direction. They're kind of up a creek, speaking of bad decisions, right? <laughs> And it's like, do I proactively reach out to them and be like, hey, you should have paid my $3,500 retainer. And I know your campaigns are working now, but you're just paying that in case they aren't. You know, I don't know. So, but I also kind of look at it where I'm like, you're you're a big person. You're a CMO. You can make that decision for your own. Good. Hey, again, this might say, <laughs> I'm giving you this advice, but really it's anyone that's listening in that runs an agency. If you stop working with a client, Right, but you still have access to their account through the MCC. The best thing you can do for yourself is to take yourself out of that account because <laughs> it is horrible to sit there. And as you say, whether it's another agency they brought in to replace yeah. you or whatever, <laughs> like to sit and watch the carnage of things yes, kind of falling yes. apart. And as you say, like you see things happening, you go, "Well, I'm not paying me any money. Why should I volunteer to right. solve the problem for them?" <laughs> So I, again, I, I used to do the same thing. I had like access to a whole bunch of accounts, right? But they don't take you out of the MCC or they don't take you out analytics. I mean, again, sometimes right, it's hard right. for you to do that, right? It's hard to extricate yourself from the sort of yes. the uh, Yeah, ecosystem. you care. Right. So now it's like, as soon as if we if we've lost clients, I lost one fairly recently because they were work. we were working with one part of their business. They had another yeah. business that they had acquired or that had acquired them who were working with their own partner. So it's weren't going to work with two agencies. They, they said, we're going to go with that guy. And I'm like, cool, that's fine. Literally the minute we, we came, came off the last call, I just went, you know, remove myself, yeah, remove myself, remove myself. I just didn't want to see. Yeah. What, it's like stalking an ex. <laughs> yeah. Because every single month we'd hit the numbers that they wanted without yeah. fail for three years, religiously, without fail, hit the number every month. It was always changing, changeable number up and down, yeah. really tar really stretching target CPA yeah. and everything else, but right. we hit it. Whatever they asked us for, we hit it. And again, they were the, the people I was working with were really upset to lose the relationship yeah. that we'd built up over those three years, but they understood the new CEO had his own vision about what yeah. we were going to do and, and that was fine. Yeah. But that happens. Yeah, I mean, so now I just like, as soon as it's gone, I, I remove myself. I don't want to be, uh, <laughs> I just don't want to see it. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So you, I mentioned that you're, you're yeah. running your own business. You set it up about 11 months ago or something like that. Mm -hmm. so how, how have you fa found that? Cause it's obviously a fairly big step, big change to go yeah. from working for other people to working for yourself. How did you make that decision and how have you found yeah. it? Yeah. So I made the decision to put it nicely. I was unhappy at the agency that I was working at. Um, I, loved, loved, loved the clients, but the expectation was that the work be done on the weekends. It was nonstop meetings. It, it was a lot. And I have three kids. Um, so I think when it got emotionally painful enough, I just had to go. Um, and my daughter is a competitive dancer, which if anyone knows anything about competitive dance, it's beyond expensive. It's what we thought gymnastics would be. Dance is like quadruple that. I think the bill keeps going up and up, but we're now up to like 1500 a month. Um, and that doesn't include her costumes, which she's going to do a custom costume. And it could just go on and on. Yeah. In any case, my kid's also talented, uh, which I've never had a talented kid. So you never want to say no. So now I'm in a position where I have to have some type of income. So it was leave my job and, and do something. But you so, also have the flexibility to be able to kind of, again, yes, with Boris, he, yeah. he runs his own business, so yes. he can take the summer off and spend it with his yes. wife and his daughter. Yes. And, yep. and yep. Again, he's got nobody to answer to for that, exactly. right? So, exactly. You yep. know, and I'm guessing so, you're going to be in the same boat, right? You can, same, same. Yeah, my husband was like, just make 3000 a month. I'm like, okay, that's not, that's not hard. So that's where we're at. And uh, I made, you know, way, way more than that. But he set a, a goal that I found was achievable. Um, but it's exactly what you said. Like I bought a pool membership this summer. I spent like, I mean, I probably worked like on average eight hours a week. Like I just really took the summer to uh, just work kind of work on the business 
And then the clients that I had were on that consulting route. So it would, I would have these, I'm going to call them like short retainers, so training consulting. So they'd be three to four month engagements where I'd build and coach the team. And so I knew my income and I could, I could do that. Um, and then I build into the contract what works for both of us. So the contracts a lot of times were no before work, no after work, but I'll teach you absolutely everything I know. And, and, yeah, and, and, and I, yeah. I always say that a good agency or a good consultant, they need to train their customers to work yeah. the way they yeah. want them to work. Yeah. I went to uh, Brighton SEO at the end of last year, and there's, a, do you know Crystal Carter who works for Wix? Yeah. Amazing, yeah, amazing, yeah. <laughs> amazing lady. But yes. she was like doing some stuff for TikTok and she interviewed me and she was, because I, I was attending yeah. a round table for agency owners. And I said, whenever I have a new client that I land, I always say to them, look, the conversation I have is, look, I'm really good at running paid search campaigns. Yeah. I'm really crap at chasing people for money. Yeah. If I ever have to make a call chasing yes. you for money, we are done. Yes. Yeah. And I do that before we have even started working with them. And every single client I've ever had since I had that conversation, it's never, ever been an issue because they know we've had the conversation. Mm. If they're going to have a problem, they'll pick up the phone and talk to me about it. So it's not going to hit me as a, wow, mm. this is unexpected. I, should, I, I was expecting money and I didn't get it. If you set the expectations, if you say, I'm married, I've got three kids, the kids are my life, I have the summers yeah. off. Yeah. But and again, when we're working, I'm 100% with you and we're, we're going to get stuff done. But just expect a lot less from me in the sum. One of the reasons why I chose working with e-commerce businesses that run on Shopify is, generally speaking, most e-commerce businesses have a bit of a lull in the summer. Right, yeah, yeah. dives completely with what I'm looking for. I'm looking yeah. for businesses that maybe are much busier in the fourth quarter of the year and the first quarter of the year, but maybe yeah. quieter in the second and, and third quarters. So Yeah, yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, so you, you posted on LinkedIn uh, I think about a mm -hmm. week ago. You had a poll that was running <laughs> and you were talking about is PPC dying. So you, yes. you kind of, you had a poll, I think there's about 380 people on LinkedIn gave you a response. Yeah. And I think the yeah, response was like 78% said no and 28% said yes. Uh, but you said you had some opinions and yes. that you were going to share them. So I, yeah. I read through the comments. I couldn't really see like a full, this yeah. is kind of like, you, you, you got you wanted to get stuff off your chest maybe this is a good yeah. venue for you to get stuff <laughs> off your chest in terms of what you thought yeah so i i will say i think it's dying i do um and i think someone in the comments made a joke like oh yeah the internet's dying and blah 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 okay i get it i think big companies are still going to spend a ton of money in google ads uh, i do think for the average business owner it's unfortunately a dying death of a thousand cuts. Um, I believe that it's, we're back to the holistic marketing. Uh, I think I had mentioned organic social, getting the younger generation is just less attracted to the ads. Uh, so it is as a business owner, picking up your face and being like, this is my business. It's human to human authentic content. I think that's where it's at right now. And so, yes, I think it's dying. If I had to summarize what I think, I think it was in that comment. Somebody said the management of it is dying. Um, and it simply is because these small businesses, they can't afford to pay for ads and then pay someone like an agency, a huge retainer. Yeah. But to again, do that. again, if you, if you look at it, I, I always used to say to people, it is incredibly easy to set up a Google ads account and to spend Correct. money, right? Yes, tons. Had, again, if you're, a, if you're a small local business, yes. they made it super, super easy with AdWords Express. Yes, so yes. We're just, campaigns now. Yeah. yeah. You just come in, give us your credit card yes. and we'll do everything. Yes. And, you know, again, like it's, it's only when you switch to the advanced mode and you see all the things that mm -hmm. they've stripped away to make yes. that environment for you, realize just how bad a yes. kind of... AdWords Express, smart campaigns, whatever, yes. really is. But but I think yeah. the challenge is, I mean, Google's objective has always been they want to make mm -hmm. as much money for themselves, right? Mm -hmm. Which means that, that advertisers have to make a certain amount of money in order for them right. to keep the lights on and keep the businesses going and everything else. So, yeah. But they need to give you just enough. They're never going to go, 
I could deliver you. I could deliver you clicks at like ten cents a throw, but I'm going to charge you fourteen dollars a click right. because yep. that's what the auctions kind mm -hmm. of like. They're going to charge what they can afford to get away with. That's of the course. way they've always done it. And yes. they say, "Oh, it's all smart auctions, yeah. AI, and just leave it to us, and we'll do everything." Again, the, the kind of the skeptics, and I consider myself to be probably the, one of the biggest skeptics going, will always be, actually, you know what? I don't think that that's actually true. And I, I think sometimes, again, I think when you look at the, um, the, the kind of the legal stuff that's going on in the background now, and when you read through some of that, I spend time, loads of time reading through 10 Qs and quarterly returns to see what's going on because they have to be very truthful in those, otherwise they go to jail. But they're also like all the you know, transcripts yeah. from these yeah. hearings that took place. And I think they're fluffing the cushions or checking the right. back of the cushions. <laughs> I've always been cynical of, of the way in which they've run their business. But at the same mm -hmm. time, it's like I've made a very good living off the same. back right. of working right. yes. in collaboration same. with same. Google. So I've always said same. I've got a hate-hate relationship with them. But it's again, it's been very beneficial for all of us. The clients I've worked yes. with, them and yeah. me. We've all done really well on the back of it just think at the moment the amount of restrictions that they're trying to apply yes. with ai has yes. made the creativity that i think a lot of re people that were really good at it so we used to be able to get youtube gda and all that sort of stuff dialed in really well yes. yeah. it took a bit of bit of effort but we eventually got to the point where we knew exactly what to do we knew what to exclude we knew what to add and all that sort of stuff mm -hmm. whereas now it's almost because they come up with pmax all of a sudden it's like mm -hmm. well, that, that just does everything and they're, again i think they're what they're trying to do is they're trying to capitalize. They see the money that Facebook or Meta are making on the back of some of their, the, yeah. the, I mean, search has always been, you type in a, right. a search term because people are looking specifically for something that, mm -hmm. that is of interest now, rather than it being contextual and it's a bit more etheric. So right. I think with, with some of the stuff that goes on in Facebook, people are not going to Facebook looking for no, one right. thing in particular. They might be interrupted by something yeah. And they might see an ad and go, oh, actually, yeah, I'm looking for magnetic eyelashes. Great. Right. Right, fine. But, um, but it's not something that, we're, that they were actively thinking of and searching right. out, going seeking it. Right. right? So, yes. um, yeah, I, I just, I, you know, I just, I just think it's, it's sort of, there will always be a place for consultants, for good yes. agencies. Yes. Yes. I think the challenge is the barrier for entry for agencies is super low. You could probably I, set up an agency for like a hundred bucks, domain name. Yeah. Email, email account, yes. website on WordPress, bang, I'm an agency. Yes. There's nothing yes. to say you've got any experience of doing it. Right. And to your point about the yes. the kind of ma managing a, a kind of an yeah. omni-channel or multi-channel market strategy, that's typically not something that most agencies that are brand spanking new can actually do anything right. near what they need to. And that's right. always one of the challenges. Sometimes you pick up a client that's had five or six, five or six really bad experiences with agencies because right. they made bad decisions in yes. hiring agencies because they yes. got sucked in <laughs> by the promises that were made to them that were completely unrealistic. I, I always say to, to clients, if they go, well, I'm going to give you a thousand dollars and I need you to get me like 500 leads a day, every day for a month for a thousand dollars. And some agencies will go, yeah, sure. I can do that. And yeah. then they go, yeah, right. right. Whereas I'm going to push back and I'm going to go, you know what? It's not yeah. even going to be close to yeah. anywhere near that you're not competitive you need to be much more proactive again if their site sucks i'll say your site sucks your landing pages suck because i'm not a, I'm, as much as i'm i say i'm good at ppc i'm not a magician i no, can't make no. a really crappy landing page right. into into a silk purse it just doesn't work so and you really have to be brutal with your feedback when it comes to doing those sorts of things the interesting Per, is more and more I'm actually getting clients from large agencies paying large retainers that are also in a bad predicament. So I thought it was only the cheap agencies, um, but these larger agencies and what it is, is they'll have somebody that's fairly junior that has been put on an account. Or if it's not someone junior, it's somebody that has 40 accounts on their plate. So it's like there's this this is the lack of what the client needs, which is like the conversational part being like, Hey, this is what I'm seeing in your account. What does this mean to you? I mean, there've been times, especially in B2B where I'll see search terms and they're like, actually, yes, that's very helpful. Let's make a campaign about that. There's a lot of data and insights and keep in mind old school us. We used to say like PPC is about performance, but PPC is about learning. And that has been a lost craft.
Yeah. And when you're loading people up, it's almost like you're treating paid search management as a light switch. And it's not, it's an insight and an open door into your business. Yeah, I've, And I've, so I feel like that is why the consulting route works so much better for me than, because I can say, this is what I see. And I'm not tying to the fact that you're, you're spending 30,000 now, you need to spend 10. Now let's look at this. Yeah. I've always said that people hire an agency or a consultant for one of two things. They either hire them for expertise or they hire them for utility, right? Mm -hmm. And if they're utility, then yeah, by all means, go to your Philippines, your kind of <laughs> Indias, your Pakistans or whatever. Yes. Again, I've got nothing against, I've, I've yeah. got some really amazing people that work in all those countries who are fantastic at doing what mm -hmm. they do. But it's, again, they, you, you mm -hmm. know, you, it's not just about what you do with the accounts. You also need right. to manage the relationship and everything else. Exactly. Again, it's very, very difficult to kind of have all of those components handled by one individual yeah. or whatever it might, whatever you might be. But it is one of those things. I think a, a lot of people hire, hire you for expertise, but mm -hmm. then don't lean on your expertise. They just want you to kind exactly. of do this, do Turn this, do this, do yes. this. Yes, not, yes. That's not what yeah. you hired me for, right? Yeah. Again, yeah, exactly. and I've actually resigned accounts. I've said, look, you want me to do all this stuff, but really, in all honesty, I'm way too expensive for you Six. to pay me to do that when you could hire yeah. some monkey to do that, like yeah. easy. Yes, same. Right? same. It'll be much cheaper than me, right? Yeah, yeah, yes. Because you're not relying on my expertise. You're just going to go, right. you're going to tell me what to do, right? Yeah, and they'll go, exactly. well, the previous agency did that. I'm like, yeah, but you fired the previous agency because they yeah. didn't get no, any results, I right? <laughs> I've had that too. I have, I've had business owners that enjoy just telling me what to do when it's not working. And I'm like, it's not working. And then you're just to the point where you're like, I don't even want my name anywhere near this account. Like, you know, I've had, and it's always sad when you get like a business owner, but used to run ads. I think Julie gave me the term, like it's see, I would do it myself if I had time client. And like, they're just like, it worked in 2011 like this. Yeah. I had a, a client that had duplicated the entire ads account from something that had worked, you know, 10 years prior. And I'm like, just unwilling to maybe there's like some cognitive dissonance going on there. And yeah. you try, you try your best. Yeah, you absolutely. Really do, and sometimes you can't. Just because something impact. worked then doesn't mean it'll work even remotely close to now. Right. So, because yeah. Yeah. the world is different. Exactly. Exactly. So, I see that you're you're speaking at HeroConf in yes yes is that in November is yes I, uh, in San Diego. So I mean, have you done a lot of speaking over the years, or? Yeah, so um, I mean, I guess I'm always speaking to clients. So when I was at a big agency, I was always speaking to clients. It was more time in decks, almost probably fifty fifty with the ads platform. But like speaking at conferences, I spoke at Brighton and then just a lot of online speaking too. I never say no to podcasts. Um, I think making my own TikToks, like I just, I'm always putting myself out there. Um, and it's actually one of the ways that I've gotten clients. I also lead the Paid Search Association webinars. I'm the host. And I, I try to tell people like there are great ways to get clients because clients will take the time to listen to podcasts more than they will listen to like a TikTok. It's a, it's a, you're spending 30 minutes, 40 minutes with the person versus, you know, 20 seconds. There's a more of an investment there. So I'll do that. Um, yeah. And then I write to you for search engine land. So, so when you actually speak at a conference, do you have a specific, because again, I, I know that the, mm -hmm. the whole subject of speaking at conferences, yeah. right. And whether you should be paid or you shouldn't be paid and whether they should cover your travel costs or not. And, everything else like most of the, the kind of the speaking I do now right it's because the person who runs the conference is a good friend of mine and I'm trying to help them out so for me again it's like historically I used to get uh, again like shooting fish in a barrel and stand up on stage present at a conference <laughs> like PubCon I mean I'm doing PubCon with Fred Valets and Steve okay. Hatton we're doing yeah. a workshop yeah. and um, I'm also doing like an advanced PPC session uh, it used to be historically you'd stand up at a conference like that it'd be yeah tons and tons of people in in the crowd that were decision makers budget holders you'd finish speaking say if anyone needs any help, I'll, be, I'll be at the back of the room there'd be like a queue of people that wouldn't want to come and work with you and because again yeah, no, i've always maintained that that however much the tickets cost you probably double that in terms of the travel cost for the individual 
Uh, they may have brought team members with them and everything else. So it's a fairly significant investment of their time and money to come along. right? And I don't want to stand there and just give them really basic crap that they could watch five YouTube videos and get the same information that I'm giving them. I want to give them the good stuff. Let's say they've spent five grand to come to the conference with the ticket cost, the hotel, the flight, the incidentals, beers in the bar, whatever it might be. Um, I want them to get five grand's worth of value out of my presentation right, yeah. alone. And yeah. then everything else that they see at the event is just gravy. I think a lot of it is there has definitely been a challenge with uh, event organizers. I had clients that were event organizers and it was to see things from the, the background, like in terms of do you provide food or do you not provide food? Mm -hmm. Do you have all panels? Of, again, like there's some industries right. where the industries are heavily, heavily white mm -hmm. male dominated so you'll have a panel with four white men on it yes, right? and yeah. a lot of uh, women quite rightly say mm -hmm. that's not right that's not representative of the industry right. so again a, a lot of conferences now are trying to go down the route of having equality between 50 percent men 50 percent women yeah right? yeah which again I, I think is great yes but for me the the challenge has always been going back to the you want to have subject matter experts on stage. So yes. it's like, if yeah. I can have four women that are the subject matter experts, mm -hmm. great. If it's four men and they're the best that I, that, that I can get, great. I'm not picking them because of their gender or the color of their skin. I'm picking them because they know what they're talking about. Because right. I don't want to right. have one person that's really good, three people that they're just to make up a quota to make it good for the, the kind of the event organizer. And then people complain about the content wasn't that great because three right. Three people that are not, it just becomes a, a messy, messy situation at that point yeah. to try and balance everything out. And again, it's almost like a tread, treading on eggshells trying to yes. run, run yeah. an event. I can't imagine how anyone would want to run, run an event, but hats off to anyone that does. Right, right. Yeah. No, I, I mean, I love it. And I mean, I found, so I guess that we hadn't been doing conferences since before 2020. And it was funny. I remember at Brayton, it was Brighton that now they purchased the PPC Hero brand. I remember sitting and just being just absolutely riveted by the content and thinking, I actually don't have ADHD. I've just been watching these speakers uh, actually online. So like, do you know Perna? I think. Oh yeah, I had Perna on. Phenomenal yeah. speaker. Love, I mean, like, she just like mesmerized yeah. me. Yeah. You know, and so it was like these people that I've known online and just seeing their stage presence they take it up like, you know, yeah. like five notches. Yeah, it's, and, it's, it's funny. I mean, I, I know yeah. Kelvin that, that runs Brighton SEO yes, here. Yeah. I mean, in the UK, yeah. um, I, I, I try and go to Brighton SEO in the UK. Yeah. They, they have two events, one usually in the spring, one in the autumn. Yeah. Or the fall, as you guys call it. Um, yeah. And I try and go to one or the other. I tend, tend yeah. not to do both of them. Um, but it's, again, it's re really interesting here in the UK because it's a much more well-established, very, yeah. very popular uh, conference yeah. there is definitely a lot more first-time speakers new speakers yeah. like it again like the a lot of the tickets that kind of are put up there they're put up in a sort of ballot so people get free tickets for the conference some of the people that speak have sponsored booths and they speak because mm -hmm. their company mm -hmm. paid for a sponsorship that included a speaker slot again even if that's the case you still want them to add value you don't want them to kind of just oh, yeah, pitch yeah. you know you don't want it to be a sales pitch and i've had oh, I've seen yeah. situations yeah. where People stand up on stage and do that. They pitch. And I'm like, whoa, this is, I made the mistake of sitting right in the middle of a row. I'm like, God, I want to get up and leave, but this is like, it would look really, really awkward if I did. So I was right yeah, in the front yeah. in the middle. And I just thought no, that, that wouldn't be right. But um, yeah, I mean, I, I just think, but I think the Brighton SEO that was held in San mm. Diego, I mean, I spoke to lots of friends who went, people mm. like Nava, who, again, who's been a guest on the yes. podcast. Um, and they said that the, the speaker kind of, quality was amazing and again amazing, I think Kelvin yeah. pulled out all the stops he kind of yeah. he threw the kind of you know I don't I want a whole bunch of new people to one side because he wanted to make sure mm -hmm. he made the right splash when he launched yeah, in yeah. in the US and I definitely think that that's something that he achieved for sure yeah um, no it was phenomenal and I mean I would definitely say a mix of new speakers and old but like our the new speakers like we were new but we've been around yeah. and we've been speaking so like they, people that are new speaking, but I didn't know they were new, like Menachem 
uh, it was his first time speaking. Oh, really? It was, yeah. Again, yeah. He's, he's so knowledgeable about. The, so not, wait, the so it's like these people, it didn't matter if it, they were new, they deserved to be there, just like people that were older. And then as far as the pitching, I would say like Nava does, like when she plugs Optimizer on the Optimizer stage. Yeah. So let's be fair about it. I love how she does it because it's at an appropriate time and then she laughs about it. It's like, well, I'm allowed to do it because I'm on the Optimizer stage. So it never sounds like a pitch. Yeah. And it truly is a fantastically genuine tool and they provide a lot for the industry. So but, I do feel but, like there's... Again, to go back to, you know, to, to Crystal from Wix, I mean, you know... Yes, they, Crystal, the same. They, they hammer the living same. daylights out of Wix, but it's yeah. like done in such a nice, nice yes, way, yes, right? Yes, yes, Everything yes, about yes. it. Love Crystal. Like, you know, yes. so it's again, like, so although... She's talking about Wix and, and uh, Mordy's talking about Wix when he's presenting. It's, yes. kind of, you know, yeah. don't mind. I mean, again, you know, you want people to talk about the company yeah. that they're representing if they're proud mm -hmm. to represent the company and the company's good, but don't make it a, yeah. a an yeah. out and out yeah. sales pitch. You can kind yes. of, again, yeah. you're absolutely right. Nava, Nava will do it in a much more subtle and diplomatic way. Exactly. I, I love Optimizer. I love, I love watching Fred present. So the Same. fact that he Same. and I are presenting at PubCon, I'm just blown away because I get, oh, yeah. I get, I get yeah. to sit there and, and enjoy <laughs> listening to him as well as he yeah. can sit and listen yeah. to me. I mean, I'm sure he'll blow me away far more than I'll blow him away. I think I have a different viewpoint on the topic. And I think when you look at it, I mean, we've mm. brought three white guys together, Steve, Fred and me, and people who go, well, yeah. you know, you shouldn't have that. But again, I think when you look at it, you know, we are three very well <laughs> Well, yeah, kind of yeah. traveled, versed, yes, EPC yes. people that know our stuff. Yes. And I, I, yeah, yeah, yeah. And I feel like, um, you know, to your point, uh, and maybe, maybe the bar is higher among white men at this point. And I say right back at you because I had to take some time after having kids. So too bad. So sad. <laughs> but I would also say, like, there is a space for what I'm going to call like white men that do like everything in their power to lift up women. So like I would classify like Boris for sure, someone in that category. Like if he was on a white male panel, like I would be really remiss if someone said something because all he does is cheer for us. Yeah. So I do think there's it, like, it's very, very clear, but it's like a white man that doesn't support women versus a white man who just happens to be a white man, but supports like, I mean, think about all the women guests you've had, you're a woman yeah. supporter. And, and, the, and the thing is, I mean, I, I have, um, you know, we're like female members of my family who work right, in our exactly. industry. And certainly when, when we first started, I mean, there was so few women that did it, but it's, yeah. it's a yeah. perfect, it's a perfect yeah. career for yes. females. Tim Ash, when I, when I had him on as a guest, he was talking about how women are far better than men at digital marketing because it doesn't require any physical kind of you don't need to have big guns and, and everything else it's just you just need to be <laughs> smart and intelligent and you know yeah yeah and like emotional there's like an exactly. emotional component to marketing that i i was just reading an article i have to submit it today for search engine land it was on the ai component and it's like there's a lacking our world is lacking emotion right now and that's like the, what women can oftentimes bring yeah but to to your point i mean like so pre-pandemic I did a lot of speaking. I'd probably spend three yeah. months of the year traveling, right? Speaking yeah. at lots of conferences. And then when COVID happened, I obviously got involved in doing more yeah. sort of webinar -y type things. So I invested money in lighting and cameras mm -hmm. and microphones, and all that sort of stuff. Um, but it, it got to the point where when things had got back to normal, that the, the speaking was, was available. I, I did, again, I just... I was conscious of the fact that I was too old, too white, and take too male, right? But I think the, the the kind of the component that's probably given me the confidence to go back and do it again, yeah. right, is that I'm also probably very yeah. knowledgeable, which I think there you go. in some exactly. respects, like probably in certainly my view, it, it's like it gives me a decent chance of having a place on the stage, right? Yes. And to, to your point, I'm absolutely all for helping yeah. raise up the women in our industry. Exactly. And I do a lot of, in um, the affiliate industry, there's an initiative called Link Unite, where it's all women. I've spoken loads about it, right? I've met the two, two ladies that, that founded it, Sarah and Amanda, and they're fantastic, really, really great business women, 
<laughs> love love what they're doing there. Every every woman I know in the industry, I've said, look, you should join this. It's fantastic. Not right. I, how would I know it's fantastic? Because I'm not a member of it. Because right. I can't be right. a member of it. But at yeah. the same time, all the women I know that are in it are powerful business leaders, very yes. successful. Right. So if you get in there, there's every likelihood that that you'll pick up off the vibe of of the, the women that you have, and they have like events, and they obviously do a lot lots of sponsorships they do like a mentee mentor situation where they'll pair up a well-established person and a newcomer which again mm. i think i think is phenomenal i mean like I've, I've i've been to lots of conferences where we have like a something called a speakers enclave where we will help yeah. first time speakers yeah. we'll, we'll get everyone that's a brand new speaker mm. and we'll help walk them through how to yeah. present themselves and everything else yeah. and again I, I do that i've done that with loads and loads of people who have ended up going on to become keynote speakers, but they yeah, were doing yeah. it for the first time and they were absolutely nervous as hell. But I'm like, look, you'll be phenomenal. You know your stuff. And I would, I kind of did a little bit, bit of training and help, right, to kind of make sure that yeah. they were going to be good and they were absolutely fantastic. And uh, I've also done it where when I had an event or event clients, I would go to other events and sit in the front row and watch people <laughs> speak. And I would watch particularly women. I'm looking <laughs> for really smart women who are, have a good stage presence, a good kind of command of their topic. Mm. Some of them I, I managed to get on stage, keynote, mm. keynote at, at conferences, because I've actually watched them present and I know that I'm yeah. not just putting it up because, you know, I, th I think Nava called it eye candy, right? It's like, again, <laughs> I really couldn't care what they look like. It's like, do they know what they're talking about? Have they got yeah. a good commanding presence on the stage? I'm like, good God, I'm 45. I could have been eye candy when I was 20. When I when I was building that YouTube channel, right? Like, no. But, yeah. uh, um, that's funny. That's funny. <laughs> so, so, Sarah, where do you yeah. see our industry going, like, in terms of, like, maybe the next five years, right? You, you say it's doomed and dead, right? Do you think uh, it's kind yeah, of... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so, I do think... Um, it mimics the economy a lot. I think that's the reality. I mean, it's marketing. It's sort of always seen as like an extra. So just as if we look at the economy and what's happening is you have the people that can afford it and the people that cannot afford it. And that gap is getting wider and wider. And I think that that is going to continue to happen. Uh, so I think it's going to be tougher for freelancers that aren't able to adapt which is why I've, again, chosen this consulting model. So for me, it is also making those relationships with larger agencies. So I didn't talk about that, is that if I bring on a client and I'm consulting them and I feel like they need an agency, I have partnerships where I can refer them out to an agency. And sometimes it would be a straight referral. Other time it's, times, it's sort of a soft referral where I'm referring them, but I'm engaging in that project at the very beginning and helping with that strategy. Now, you do have to have a very, very, very tight relationship with the larger agency to do that because no agency wants somebody else to dictate a strategy. Yeah. So, you no, know, I already have those types of relationships in place. So, yeah, I, I think, I think, I think that's important. And, and yeah, again, yeah, like going that. back to kind of pre pandemic, I used to do the, all this traveling, right? And a lot of it was to forge those relationships with yeah. agency owners and, yeah. and, and everything else. Because, again, if, if you, if you don't do something that yourself, so like yes. I said, we, we specialize on in e-commerce business, Shopify stores, right? But there'll be people that are running on, you know, big commerce or WooCommerce, yeah. or they've got their own kind of custom built proprietary system, or they're doing lead generation in, you know, finance or, you know, yeah. whatever. But I, again, I know lots of other agency owners that, that kind of do SEO yeah. that do like organic yeah. TikTok and stuff like that. So, and, and. For me, it's like I've never necessarily, I haven't worked with them, but I know right. the people behind them yes. and I yes. know that they have integrity in kind of the way yes. they conduct themselves and, and everything else. So I would feel confident and comfortable to put them forward as a, right. somebody says, hey, I need some help with this. I've yes. got a big book yeah. of contacts that I can just say, well, talk to exactly. Sarah because Sarah's really good at this or that. So it's, I know what people are good at and I know what they don't do and, and that way I can help make some some yeah. introductions because again ultimately i just want to make sure right there there are way more clients needing help than there are yeah. good people to do the help so True. i just want to make sure that the clients that need the help can get the help yes. without yes. getting the the kind of poor experiences that you'll hear from yeah. so many oh, yeah. other <laughs> people where they go oh, I, 
three agencies before and they're all horrible and I'm, I'm just wits end. Because ultimately, if a, if a client is, let's say they've got a CMO, the CMO could right. be under huge pressure for their job because they made yeah. three yeah. bad decisions, hiring yeah. three agencies that failed. Right, they, exactly. So you, you, in some respects, you could be the agency that stand between this person losing their job or yeah. getting yeah. promoted. So yeah. I have a vested interest in making sure that I, I can make them look good in the eyes of their bosses. That's all. No, that makes I sense. do that in a lot. I always say, like, my job is to make you, you look good to your yes, boss. Yes, right? yes. Yep. You, I can yeah, only do no, that that's... if you help me by doing the things that I'm asking you to do. I'm not asking you just for, for fun, for shits and giggles. I really need you to do this stuff. Right, right. No, that absolutely makes sense. So, yeah, I think that's that's where it's going to go. I think, unfortunately, for the single channel, I just do Google Ads, and that's what gets the results. I think that's going away. Uh, I think it'll be more holistic marketers back to knowing everything and how to piece together like a full marketing strategy and then hoping that client execute that will be done either in-house or on the agency side. I think we're gonna go back to five cent clicks, <laughs> 25 yeah, character yeah, doing, titles. Yeah. 30... On TikTok, maybe. Yeah. <laughs> on t if it's like legal at that point, I don't even know. I, I, I do sometimes find myself when we can hope for a new social media thing. Like just something new should come out. Yeah. Because I do feel like knowing what I know now, I'm like, if something new on social media comes out, just run to it. Just run to it. That's how you build until it goes down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's funny. I remember when, when Quora first came out, like they had organic Quora yeah. and then they came out with an ad product. Yeah. And I had some success with it, but again, not so much that I really thought is primarily it's B2B, right. right? So it didn't really right. vibe with my e-commerce yeah. kind of strategy. So, you know, but I think for people that are in certain verticals in B2B, it makes sense. Yeah. Core would be great for that, right? Yeah. Both from yeah. organic and a paid perspective. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's hilarious. But uh, yeah. Running through it all. But I think the challenge is you can spread yourself way too thin. Right again, yeah, you know, yeah. and uh, yeah, to, yeah. To, to, like you, you've obviously got your kids, and they're the most right. important thing in your life, and your husband, mm -hmm. and you know, yeah. the, your social life and fitness and everything else. It's like you know, exactly. can't do any good, can't do good work for people if you're dead, right? So yeah, if you, you don't know, take you care of yourself, yourself. Yeah. you need to look after your mental health. Right? Yeah. I've always encouraged like people when they get the opportunity to spend a bit of money and travel to go to conferences. Even if you're not speaking yep. at the conferences, it's an opportunity for you to meet your peer group, yes. right? hang yep. out, yep. go and have a drink yeah. in the bar, go for dinner. Yep. You'll, you'll get a, a really good feeling from kind of yep. going along. Yeah, right? and build the relationships that yep. I think really make the industry what it is, right? Yeah. I think that's, that's the best thing. If I need an SEO, you'll know who to call, right? Yeah. So. Yeah, and it's funny, I've done a little bit of SEO, but really it's not been my sort of my core competency. But I know so many people that do SEO. I know lots of people yeah. that work at Google, right, in on the, the sort of, um, you know, web spam team and stuff like that. So yeah. people get booted out of Google. I can make calls, <laughs> things yeah. fixed pretty quickly, yeah. even though I'm a paid search guy. But again, I made the, the effort to go yeah. and meet these people at conferences and hang out with them and go out to dinner and everything else. Not because right, right. I was trying to get something from them. I wanted information. Or anything like that. Yeah, same. Yeah. Just want to hang out with them. Yeah, just have fun. Sure. Um, so Sarah, thank you so much for being on as a guest. It's been awesome. phenomenal to have you on. Um, yeah. I know that obviously all of your information will be in the show notes mm -hmm. and I'll make those available kind of after we come off awesome. air. Um, if there was one place that you, you said, this, if you want to connect with me, this is the best place to go. Where would that be? LinkedIn. LinkedIn. Okay, yeah. great. And, and obviously, like I said, your LinkedIn profile will be on the show notes. Awesome. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think for me, it's been um, phenomenal yeah, to have you on. It's as been a really fun. And um, hopefully at some point in time, we'll get the, uh, the opportunity yeah. to meet in person and actually yeah. maybe share a stage or whatever. For sure. <laughs> but certainly have a drink and, and kind of hang yeah. out. And yeah, um, yeah I mean, at, yeah. at some point in time, I'm hoping to kind of get along to a, a Brighton SEO or a hero yeah. column for whatever the kind of combined thing is. Um, but yeah, I mean, if you ever find yourself in the, um, the UK, come to Brighton SEO here in the UK. Yeah. I know my way around Brighton pretty well. I know all the good yeah. pubs, all the good restaurants, all the good <laughs> bars. And um, I've never yeah. been to Europe, so that would be really fun. And Brighton's a really, really cool place. 
I would need to take like five Xanax to get through like an overseas flight. You'd but... be fine. <laughs> Honestly, you'd be fine. Um, right. Awesome. Brilliant. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll, we'll see you on the next episode of Bad Decisions yep. with Jim yeah. Blanks.